Welcome to Why Is This Good, a podcast by the Naples Writers Workshop. I'm Christine and I'm here with John. Hey, John. Hello. All right, it's my turn. I picked a story that I, I believe was originally published in The New Yorker. It's called A Temporary Matter and it's written by Jhumpa Lahiri. Briefly, it's a story about a couple that's living in like an apartment complex and they get a notice that for a few hours each night that week, they're going to turn the power out to repair something. And so it's about how they they deal with the darkness. Wow. This is a fantastic story. This is so well done. Yeah. He wondered what Shoba would tell him in the dark. The worst possibilities had already run through his head, that she'd had an affair, that she didn't respect him for being 35 and still a student, that she blamed him for being in Baltimore the way her mother did. But he knew those things weren't true. She'd been faithful, as had he. She believed in him. It was she who had insisted he go to Baltimore. What didn't they know about each other? He knew she curled her fingers tightly when she slept, that her body twitched during bad dreams. He knew it was honeydew she favored over cantaloupe. He knew that when they returned from the hospital, the first thing she did when she walked into the house was pick out objects of theirs and toss them into a pile in the hallway. Books from the shelves, plants from the windowsills, paintings from walls, photos from tables, pots and pans that hung from the hooks over the stove. Shukumar had stepped out of her way, watching as she moved methodically from room to room. When she was satisfied, she stood there staring at the pile she'd made, her lips drawn back in such distaste that Shukumar had thought she would spit. Then she'd started to cry. He began to feel cold as he sat there on the steps. He felt that he needed her to talk first in order to reciprocate. That time when your mother came to visit us, she she said finally, when I said one night that I had to stay late at work, I went out with Jillian and had a martini. He looked at her profile, the slender nose, the slightly masculine set of her jaw. He remembered that night well, eating with his mother, tired from teaching two classes back to back, wishing Shoba were there to say more of the right things because he came up with only the wrong ones. It had been 12 years since his father had died and his mother had come to spend two weeks with him in Shoba so they could honor his father's memory together. Each night, his mother cooked something his father had liked, but she was too upset to eat the dishes herself and her eyes would well up as Shoba stroked her hand. It's so touching, Shoba had said to him at the time. Now he pictured Shoba with Jillian in a bar with striped velvet sofas, the one they used to go to after the movies, making sure she got her extra olive, asking Jillian for a cigarette. He imagined her complaining and Jillian sympathizing about visits from in-laws. It was Jillian who had driven Shoba to the hospital. Your turn, she said, stopping his thoughts. At the end of their street, Shukumar heard sounds of a drill and the electrician shouting over it. He looked at the darkened facades of the houses lining the street. Candles glowed in the windows of one. In spite of the warmth, smoke rose from the chimney. I cheated on my Oriental Civilization exam in college, he said. It was my last semester, my last set of exams. My father had died a few months before. I could see the blue book of the guy next to me. He was an American guy, a maniac. He knew Urdu and Sanskrit. I couldn't remember if the verse we had to identify if I was an example of a gazal or not. I looked at his answer and copied it down. It had happened over 15 years ago. He felt relief now, having told her. I think I read a summary of what this was, and it's what I gave at the beginning here, the, the idea that power goes out, and then this couple ends up having these conversations. And I was like, that's good enough for me. It's such a simple premise. It's real. And you know from a simple premise like that, that the strength of the story is not the premise, right? It's what they're mm-hmm. going to discuss in the dark. And I was like, all right, sent it off to John. Didn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like you, I, I, I was like kind of blown away by the story. I loved it. The ending was kind of weird for me. I wasn't sure what to take from it. But basically, it's a series of like these honest conversations and there's so much packed in each sentence that told you so much about their backstory that I had to reread especially the first two pages like I found myself stopping at the end of a paragraph and realizing that I didn't just read a beautiful paragraph because all the writing all the sentences this is like my jam I love when this each individual sentence to me sounds beautiful but they're also cramming so much information in so even the section that I read where he's talking about oh yeah you know I remember the bar we used to go to that she went with her friend to and I used to get her an extra olive. Like, okay, that might seem like nothing. But what he's really telling you is that I know my wife. I know her really well. We went to this place several, several, several times. And each of those sentences, like, they just glide through your brain so easily, so quickly because they're so well done that I sometimes, like, don't grasp all the info, you know? It's almost like poetry sometimes when something is so, is so well done that you realize you have to reread it, not for how it feels in your head, but for the info that's actually there. So there's so much, like, yeah. back in the beginning here. It's back through. Throughout. Yeah, throughout. But it was really in the beginning where I felt I needed to like kind of get my bearings, you know? When I started this story, I recently in the workshop talked about structure. And we, we talked about it on the podcast before about how, you know, you start in the scene, then you can slide into backstory a little bit to like kind of inform the, the current scene. 
and then you slide back to the current scene and you let it play out. That's like a common structure we've found in so many stories on the podcast. And so I talked about that. So when I read this, yeah. I was thinking about it in those terms. And I was like, oh, here we go. We start with the situation and we slide into backstory. And I realized we're never coming out of backstory. No. Like we're, we're coming back to the main scene, but then slipping back and back to the main scene and then slipping back. And it just, so the story lives in memories. The structure of this and the way, the way it moves through time, through the characters kind of just like recollections, memories. They even talk about memories. Like the whole point of their conversations and the pivotal moments at the end of the story is to right. remember things and tell the story of those memories. It's so deftly and skillfully done. And that's what builds the world of the story, the, the their relationship and their, their life together is those memories, which is kind of like, you know, in general, what are we, but <laughs> the accumulation of our memories, right? It's like, yeah. this is who we are. So we're like building these characters and the story through that, but it is a lot of stuff that's all at once. And as skillful as it is done, it, like you said, there's a lot of it and um, you do, you can miss, you miss stuff along the way. Right. But I don't think you're ever lost. You're never no. lost. In it. Like you said, it feels more accurate to say that this is like a story, like very much grounded in memory versus flashback because he's not saying like, Oh, for you to understand this, I got to take you back 20 years right now and then we'll catch you back up and then you'll understand it from there. Like everything that's happening in his daily life, given the state of their relationship is forcing him to draw upon things that happened in the past. It's like, these are not separate things. He's not going back into the past over and over. He's thinking about everything happening before him and what informed it, you know, and what changed. And it doesn't feel like flashback in the sense that it's like interrupting the flow of the actual plot. It's like, it has to be there at the same time for it to be told this way. I wouldn't want to read this story and see this couple sit down and have a tense conversation and say, okay, let's flashback. Let me tell you about our miscarriage or the how no. the baby died. No, we don't want that. We want it like kind of piecemeal. We want it to like dawn on us that this is why it's been difficult. We get the sense through the tone and everything and through what's happening that things are not good for this couple, but we don't need to know all at once why. We, there's something about like the way it's dropped in that lets us like discover it, but not just discover it in a way that's like, oh, aha, I get it. I, you know, this is a mystery. It's more like we're very much in his head. We're so in his head that we get what it's like to be going about your daily life with this experience that informs everything. He comes home every day and he feels kind of, well, he works from home, I guess, but he, he just feels like down. Down and he feels weighed down by this and he's stressed about what's my wife going to do next and she's different these days and now the power is going out. And I think this is a good example of like, um, I don't know if you've ever just been walking around all day and you're in a period in your life where a thought or a problem is all consuming and for him, it's the status of his relationship. This feels really authentic that way. He's not going to work all day and then having a flashback at the end of the day like, oh, that's right. That's why my relationship sucks. No, it's <laughs> on his mind throughout everything is reminding him of this and like he cannot escape this reality i think the beginning of the story works in the way i was talking about where the structure is you start with this i mean it sets the situation it's like right there the yeah. notice informed them that it would be a temporary matter for five days or electricity be cut off so we know like that's like that's what sets everything up it sets things yeah. into motion that's what where the you know, the drama is going to be it, it takes a, a little bit like there's a little conversation about it and then eventually we're in the backstory so we get the scene and then backstory i think that's the only place where it felt like okay here's the story kind of being like all right you need to know this here's what you need to know and then it just smoothly transitions into like we kind of lift back up in the present moment but then like you said we're just following his thoughts yeah his thoughts are always in those memories are always in the past and i think you're right that's exactly why it works so well it's because that is where the story is like yeah they are stuck in the past because of what happened to them and they can't get out of it and that's why their relationship is falling apart is because yeah. they're stuck in the past they can't get over what happened no there's a section on this like first page and this is like probably the weakest example but this is what i mean when i said i had to like keep rereading so there's this section where shoba like is looking at the calendar and she goes it says march 19th is today the 19th shoba walked over to the framed cork board that hung on the wall by the fridge bare except for a calendar of william morris wallpaper patterns she looked at it as if for the first time studying the wallpaper pattern carefully on the top half before allowing her eyes to fall to the numbered grid at the bottom a friend had sent the calendar in the mail as a christmas gift even though shoba and shukumar had 
hadn't celebrated Christmas that year. Today, then, Shoba announced. So you could read that section and kind of think to yourself, like, all right, I like the way the author said, you know, before allowing her eyes to fall to the numbered grid at the bottom. Like, there's something beautiful about these sentences. So it's just like running through my brain, just like feels good. And then you realize that the whole point of this section is not to tell you that, like, they got a calendar, but to kind of mention that they didn't celebrate Christmas that year. And you still don't know why. But it doesn't matter why in that moment. It's the fact that Shukumar is watching her look at the calendar and thinking about how they didn't celebrate Christmas. You know, like yeah. everything is like reminding him of that. This is not just uh, Jhumpa Lahiri saying like, by the way, they didn't celebrate Christmas. It's Shukumar like being like, everything reminds him of this horrible thing that happened. Yeah, You just feel like his grief, you know? It feels like, I mean, I know this story happens in the dark, literally, but it feels like a dark story. I really like the way, like the thing that I marked up as I was reading this was kind of the mechanics of getting into these memories and like the story is told in kind of like the standard past tense, right? The notice informed them. So it's past tense. Uh-huh. And even for the present moment, the present action of the story is that past tense mark. So the standard to get back into the, into a memory is, uh, you know, use had, right? So you'd have, uh, oh, yeah. you know, there's a moment when sh- they're remembering uh, uh, he's getting birthday candles out and it's yeah, uh, yeah, Shoba yeah. had thrown him a surprise birthday party last May. 120 people had crammed into the house. So we get that kind of had markers, you know, there's like, um, a lot of times when you're talking about past events, you know, you get that habitual, the wood, yeah. you know, yeah. and there is a couple of those where when he heard her approach, he would put away his novel and begin typing sentences. She would rest her hands on his shoulders, um, but he doesn't use that very often because right. he's concentrating on very specific singular events, the singular events that give the tone of the life, right? Yeah. Of it being habitual. Yeah. Yeah. So habitually it feels this way but here's one example of of why that feels that way yeah and when the present moment of the story is prior to the power shutting off he uses the wood there as a future tonight with no lights they would have to eat together for months now they serve themselves from the stove so like that's a moment when he's looking ahead but anyway those are just little mechanical things i marked it all up all over the place because the story does dip into memories you know you can mine this for those mechanics and how to keep the reader in place with the character of where you're thinking and how to get there back and forth. Other stories will use the present tense for the present moment and then the past tense for past time. And I think one of the things that's cool about it is it doesn't, there shouldn't be a distinction because he is reliving all these moments. Right. It should all be the same tense because it's, it's his current experience is the memory. Yeah. And I'm not going to be able to articulate this right, but like when you talk about like that sentence construction of like they had done this and that to like indicate like this habitual past no that's not habitual but, but what so what um that's just past to the past past perfect or blue perfect so is like is wood the habitual sometimes what is the habitual yeah whenever it falls into the, that in a typical story it often feels like the narrator's doing yes and here it's like we're third person but it feels like his doing yeah absolutely yeah i mean okay so just to step back the the mechanics of using had so you're telling the story in the past tense so it's like she went to the store yeah Yeah, and then you can say she had gone to the store last week so she went to the store happened in the past there is is being expressed in the past tense so you want to express a time before that you say she had gone to the store before that right and then mechanically like once you've established that she had gone to the store last week and that time now you don't have to use had anymore because you're told us where you're looking now you can just be simple past again and that time she wanted a squash and she couldn't find one right (laughs) whatever (laughs) so this time now she wanted to find a squash and she was going to spend the whole day looking for it right this sounds like a really cool story but you're always in the past tense you just use had to kind of like jump back a little bit yeah that makes or you could say uh today she went to the store and then you do habitual you'd say all last year uh she would go to the store every week something like that Right. 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 And she never found her squash. So today was going to be the day she'd finally find it. <laughs> wow. Yeah. What is this story called, John? Squash. <laughs> squash by JC Brown. Look for it in the New Yorker. Yeah. It's a novel. <laughs> that. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is one of those things where 
I don't know that she, Jhumpa Lahiri, necessarily intentionally decided to make it so that we were constantly in his head this way. I have a feeling when you're writing a story like this and you do have this like revelation that you're going to make for the readers, which is that, like I said, they had, I can't remember now if it was like a stillbirth or like technically a miscarriage, whatever. She's pretty far along in the pregnancy when she loses the kid. It has like informed the rest of their relationship dynamic, right? They can't get over this grief and it's driven them further apart. But I feel like when you write a story like this, maybe she just naturally fell into the rhythm of writing it so that every single sentence was a result of his headspace as a result of this thing that happened, you know? I don't know that you can like tell someone, write a story where every single sentence reminds the character of something terrible, you know? I feel like she must have just like naturally started writing it this way. I don't know that you can teach this like method really. Or like, I'm trying to think of like another story where like literally every sentence is... I, from my own like experience of writing, yeah. Um, sometimes, sometimes I feel as though I close my eyes. Like if I were to describe it as like a um in a visual way, I would say that I'm watching the characters and it's like, oh, she she's looking at this and that, and uh, and then she hesitates, and you know, it's kind of like from the outside. But other times, the way that I conceive of the writing is that I'm thinking about the character from their their experience of things, right? So I I'm more in their head as like what they're thinking and feeling and where their thoughts are going in the moment right so like i'm thinking of what they're looking at i'm not thinking of looking at them i'm thinking of like like i'll project the pain into my own arm to describe it wow. rather than looking at the gesture they're making about the pain from the outside so yeah. i think that that's probably something along those lines that's like a, a, i don't know i don't know it feels false to describe it that way because that's not really what's happening but that's kind of like the feeling you're trying to get in the composition i think that infuses the prose because point of view is like the root of everything it's like where are you looking right and from where is what guides the shape of every sentence or should i think guide the shape of every sentence so i think for her writing she is always in his head looking out right and so even the um description of what he's doing is his self-consideration of his own process right i'm gonna grab this pan and i'm gonna cook this food right I'm gonna, this is how i'm doing it it's not as if there's a camera on the wall watching him do it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Because then you can't write it any other way than to write it in terms of how he's thinking about what he's doing. Yeah, if you put yourself in the headspace as you're composing it. Yeah, I mean, it's probably one of the, my favorite ones that we've read. And um, Oh, I, I put it up there for sure. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to credit myself for finding it. <laughs> And this is such a personal story to them and their relationship because it's based on all those specific memories that they have. It's very intimate because it's all those specific memories. We know so much about this imaginary couple and yet it's so vastly human, you know, because yeah. the situation they're dealing with, you can see yourself in that situation. Right. Right. Like, how would I feel? Oh, my right. gosh. Yeah. So I feel like I always have a tendency to do this when I share a story, but I feel like in order to understand maybe like my takeaway or whatever, I just like, I just feel the urge to summarize, but they have these nightly things for like two or three nights where they just, they don't intend to do it, but they naturally start sharing things with each other. And the first night they're sharing these little secrets that like don't seem all that big a deal, but uh, Shukumar is like really encouraged by it because he feels like they're talking, connecting for the first time. And so like the next night he's a, a little nervous, right? Because he's like I want to do that again that was really nice and then they do do it again and then like the third night the power is not even out but they, I think they like turn the lights out and they do it again and by the end you can tell he's really feeling as if they've turned a corner right because the intimacy is back and even though this horrible thing happened to them and it's no one's fault they find themselves admitting to things that they did or said in the past that were secrets that they're not proud of because they want to like I don't know like alleviate some layer of guilt that they have about not what happened but how they've failed to connect to each other almost, you know? They both, I think, feel responsible for like how things have panned out in the aftermath. But it's so devastating because then she comes home one day and says at the end of this week-long little experiment that uh, she has an apartment and she's moving out. And then the yeah. final secret that he reveals is that, and he never told her this, he got to the hospital in time to like hold their baby and I guess she didn't get to see it. So he like describes the baby to her and he had never told her because she like wanted the sex of the baby to be a secret. I don't think he described the, I think he just, because all of that is the way it's told, it, all 
all of that is, is in his head. And then the only thing he says is it was, it was a, boy. a boy. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. Okay. So we see in his head this moment where he did get to hold the child. Yeah. We live the memory with him. Yeah. And all he says is like that it was it was a boy. And then she I mean, I took from that and I think it's fair that then she got to fill in the blanks, right? He was there in time. He got to hold the baby like she understood that. Oh, he understood that he, it was more than like the doctor saying it's a boy. I didn't go through that by myself. He was there too. Yeah. 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 So this whole time, I mean, in the section that I read, it talks about how Jillian was the friend that drove her to the hospital because he was like in the middle of something at work or school, yeah. or whatever. Like it was not, none of this was any of their faults. It's just like they've failed to con- reconnect afterwards. And she probably blamed him on someone un- unconscious. Yeah. Like, we don't know that because we're not in her head. No, but you can, you can safely assume that they, yeah. half of this is grief and the other half is they they cannot bridge the gap because there's some kind of reason. I mean, the divorce rates for families that like lose a kid, not in childbirth necessarily, but like outside of that, like an accident, there's always someone that like low key blames the other one. And like, they just cannot figure it out. It's horrible. So like, this feels like one of those like sad, 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 heavy stories because there's like no one that you really dislike. You can't even like dislike Shoba because at the end they spent this like wonderful intimate week together. Anyway, when he shares that final memory, they just like sit back down at the table and they cry together. And it talks about how like they're, crying now for the fact that they both know these things. But you can also kind of safely take away from the story that that doesn't change the fact that this is over. Anyway, I wanted to summarize all that because my takeaway from this story, I was so blown away by the end that she was going to leave. Not that she was capable of it and not that there weren't hints, you know, she's like so independent and she's so whatever, she had changed, all this kind of stuff. But I was like, oh, I can't believe that this was, you know, this is what happens. It's not a story about like rebuilding intimacy. Yeah, yeah. the story is about how she she's done. Admitting it. This, this power outage allowed them to admit it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And not in a blowout fight way, but in like a sad, quiet, all right. Let's yeah. acknowledge this together kind of way. Yeah, beautiful. So I say all that because my takeaway is that I think we probably can't hope to mimic this expertise in terms of the writing. Not going to retell this story for sure. <laughs> yeah. But what I thought was really powerful was at the surface level, characters with secrets who are revealing their secrets. But then at the, on this other level, this darker, deeper level is the fact that Shoba's real secret is not that she went and had a martini with Jillian. Her secret is that for months she's been plotting to leave, right? Yeah. And what I don't want to do is tell people like it's really cool when there's like a twist ending that you couldn't have seen coming and a character has a secret and blows everything up. That's not what's cool. What's cool about this is that these are two people that even as they're being honest to each other and even as they're like living with each other and they're not lying to each other every day, like they know each other, they're known entities that they harbor their own internal reality, you know, and we're in Shukumar's this whole time. We're not in Shoba's or else this story would be a story about how she's really sad to come home and have intimate moments with him, but she really was at the apartment complex two minutes before, right? So it's devastating to know that like you can know someone so intimately and still the secret is not that she's leaving. The secret is that she wants to leave. The secret that she's harboring is her actual internal reality. And we often forget that like characters have that. So a lot of times when dialogue especially feels inauthentic, it's because characters are too honest with each other. So we talk about like, it's nice when people misinterpret each other in dialogue or they, they're they explaining things, but not correctly. They have to repeat themselves. You know, that feels authentic. What doesn't feel authentic is like, had Shoba come home one day and said, out of the blue, I'm leaving you. It is because we cannot bridge this grief between us. <laughs> That's the kind of like movie line that like maybe sounds poetic, but it's not realistic because people don't actually do that. What they do is probably something more like this, where they tiptoe around their grief. They don't talk about it. And then that secret is so much more devastating because it's the this thing that you have to admit has been happening in the background that you just were not privy to. So I like the idea of the character having not a secret, like I said, in the sense of blowing up the plot, but a secret in the sense that they are not telling you what they feel about a situation or about another character. And they kind of like revealing that. I like also like that his secret is such that we don't learn it until the end as well. Yeah. Even though he knows it the whole time, it's not something he's thinking about. He's thinking about all these other things, which it, it never felt like a cheat. It never felt like that. It it just was right. the darkest secret. The way he introduces is like, here's the thing I was never going to tell her. That idea of having secrets, that's such a powerful driver of drama, you know? Yeah. And that is something to put into fiction. Right. And like I said, I don't think it has to be a, a secret as big as I'm leaving you. It doesn't have to be a secret like I cheated on this person. It doesn't have to be plot driven. It's just acknowledging that as humans, we cannot know someone fully inside their head. And so the secret is just like, how are they interpreting this on a daily basis? I think it works really well in 
like a an intimate relationship like this where you each have a totally different yeah. narrative for 30 years yeah let I me mean, like quickly it could be like okay here's a boss that's employing this kid and the kid's bad at his job and the kid doesn't know that the boss is employing him because he owes his dead father a favor you know it could be something like that where it's like your motives are secret to one another for 30 years i have not eaten the olives you get me special just exactly away. yeah <laughs> stupid stuff like that big stuff but it can that can be the entire story that kind of stuff is always on someone's mind in every conversation exactly. with the person they're hiding something from maybe not every moment but it's always like in the back right I already talked about my takeaway is just the the stuff about how to bring memories into this and how to drive the story with the memories. I really love the mechanics by which it's done. Yeah, this is what I'll be talking about for a while. And it makes me want to read other stuff that she's written. Oh, yeah, for sure. Well, thanks, guys. If you enjoyed this episode, consider joining our Patreon. Your support helps us keep the show running. Find out more at patreon.com slash why is this good podcast. And for industry news, writing tips, and great short fiction, join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash Naples Writers Workshop. You can also subscribe to our monthly newsletter at napleswritersworkshop.com.